He was saying there's no noise, but there should be now. So, um, so uh, moron, thanks for being here. Let me know if there's any other technical issues that I have to fix. Um, so should be fixed. Yeah, now there's noise. Yeah, isn't that great? And even sound. You're a <laughs> wonderful person to have around. I forgot to start my hey Ninja Wolf for Games Three. What's up? Thanks for stopping into the stream. Oh, and I will add, I did, uh, I, I, I purchased a little beverage for the stream. Uh, I usually don't drink this late, but for this this stream, I figured I had to, just because it was about brewing, so the expectation on stream would be that I have a beer. And I figured, well, I mean, morons in Australia, so whatever, that's not nighttime at nine o'clock, but this was a uh, a two roads. I know you were uh, you were there, right? You worked there, so you didn't work on this particular beer. Um, but I uh, stopped by my local beverage center and uh, got myself a nice little drink. Um, I finished the whole thing before the end of the stream. I'm not sure how I'll feel in the morning, but. Uh, <laughs> It's my it's my slow day tomorrow. One of my slow days. So Wednesdays are my busy days. So I can survive Tuesday or or Thursday usually. Um, it's one beer. Exactly. It's an excellent choice. Yep, it is really good. It was one of the highest rated on Untapped um, for two roads that I saw. I'm like, well, I can't go wrong. Not that I haven't had a bunch of their other stuff too. They're a very popular brewery, even in uh, upstate New York. So, nice. um, so a few things that I noticed when like, you know, I was looking at your, your slides that we're, we'll look at later and I'm looking at like what I do and what you do. And I found like, not right away in teaching, but later I was kind of like, I have a passion for games, you know, which kind of led me to Twitch and led me to, to do all this and, and technology. And I kind of combined that into my teaching. So I decided, you know what? I want to use technology in teaching and I want to do research and find out more about using games in education, which is a lot of what I do. And I combine like this hobby and a passion with my job, you know, which is teaching science. And it looks like you kind of did the same in, you know, what would you do? You love what you do. You're kind of like, you know, you're a biologist by training and you're going to combine what you're your family passion really of, uh, of fermenting things. Um, do you kind of feel that way that you've kind of incorporated kind of that hobby into your life? And so you have a happy job. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So oh, I finished my PhD. Well, okay. So I started home brewing when actually in college. So I was, I was home brewing while I was at Hartwick and then so I went to grad school, and when I was in grad school, um, working on my PhD, I started, um, I, was, I was just curious about how the commercial brewing process was different from the brewing process I was doing at home. So I cold called the local brew pub and said, hey, can I trade my free labor for education? Mm -hmm. That's... Sorry, I have a bad echo here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so, um, so he said, sure. Um, and so I spent four years as an assistant brewer. When I finished my PhD, I didn't really feel like chasing my career around the world. And my wife didn't feel like chasing me, chasing my career around the world, which happens to a lot of people who get their PhD. Um, and so I, I told my committee I was going to start a brewery. Um, but I got really lucky that my science career uh, just really took off. I got really lucky that some um, circumstances worked out really well where jobs came up for me. Um, but And the brewery didn't quite fall into place. And so I got, I got the job at Sacred Heart, a uh, tenure track job, right, kind of right out of the gate, and decided that I was going to, you know, see if there were ways that I could incorporate some of the stuff I knew about brewing into my research. Um, so 
kind of pretty early on after I started at Sacred Heart, um, I, I heard a rumor about Two Roads starting up, and I had met Phil Markowski, who's the brewer owner there, and um, the, it was just a rumor, and I ran into Phil at a beer festival, um, and I had met him a couple of times before, and I said, hey, you know, I heard this rumor, and he said, I can neither confirm nor deny, and so I started chatting with him a bit about it, and he said, well, um, it's really serendipitous that you start chatting with me because uh, we were thinking about talking to a local university to see if we could work out some kind of partnership. Um, and so it was just really perfect. Yeah, I kind of noticed that with with your career trajectory, because it follows mine, you're only two years behind me in college, that when we started getting into our careers was when the brewing thing really took off. Um, and everyone started seeming to have, be brewing at that point. I mean, you were doing it before it was cool, right? Back in uh, 99 or whatever, you know? So, uh, and then, you know, I know your New York State passed some laws or got rid of some laws to make it easier to, to brew and, and open breweries and have tap rooms and things like that. So I think that kind of coincided with your career. If you look at the path of that, like you said, uh, you know, you know, two roads and, all those other breweries started opening up and they needed some expertise. Um, now, let's talk about brewing programs because you're, you've kind of developed a brewing program at Sacred Heart, right? Um, and I was at a local brewery, I'm not gonna say where, but it was really close to where I, I teach in Rensselaer, so you can go search for it. Um, and I was talking to the guys there and the one guy, was he was, he was, I was, I was having my drink and, um, and he was, he was talking about how he didn't think brewing programs were worthwhile. He was like, if you want to brew, you just learn how to do it and you open a brewery. You know, I, I was kind of like, I don't know. There seems to be a market for it. I don't, you know, I'm not the one that works and owns a brewery. So I'm not, you know, you might be a better expert than I am, but you know, I mean, so I guess what is that counter argument, you know, to someone that says, you know what, I opened my brewery, you don't need to go to college to learn how to brew uh, beer, you know, what, what is that argument? Yeah, there are a whole lot of people that have done it that way perfectly well. And I mean, that's the way most of the people who, most of the people who opened their breweries in the 90s did it that way. You know, a lot of the big regional breweries, you know, that, you know, the famous breweries, like Anchor Steam did it that way. Um, mm -hmm. Sierra Nevada did it that way. Um, couple, uh, some of the breweries in Colorado did it that way. Victory did it that way. Um, but they just, they were home brewers that said, hey, let me put together a commercial brewery. Um, it's, it's a competitive space now, though. Um, and there are ways that you can make bad beer. Oh yeah, and especially when it's a competitive space, you you need to be making pretty good quality beer um, to get people to come to you. So, um, and and there's also a lot of a lot you can learn. Like our program, for example, we teach you a lot about the business of beer. Like mm -hmm. uh, so you. We teach you about like some of the legal stuff about you know how do you decide how to license your program like as far as like should you register as an LLC or you know, or a limited corporation or whatever right um, and then you know what what all licenses do you have to apply for do you need you know um, should you should you register as a brew pub or should you simply be a production brewery. Um, you know, what are all the other, like, what are all the health, health code, like, things that you need to pay attention to? And those are things you just don't know as a home brewer. You can find them all out. They're all out. They're available to you. But, you know, we kind of collect that in one place. We also give you a lot of experience on kind of professional level equipment, which you don't get as a home brewer either. So you can, you can go ahead and go out and buy some professional equipment and then teach yourself on it and mess up a bunch of times. And if you have enough money, 
you know, you can you can put in the time and you know spend your time learning on it and messing up batches, um, or you know another good way to do it is to go uh, get an internship somewhere, you know, um, but you have to have somebody you know give you the time to do that. They, they and you're going to learn a limited amount. You're going to learn whatever it is that they need you to do, right? kind of at their mercy so our our program our program will give you kind of a really well-rounded education we do it in a year um and i imagine you also get those connections that you might have to you know the breweries that you you know and you work with so when you have graduates that need to go out and get certain experiences and get jobs you can hopefully you know hook them up and, and get them to the the next step in their in their careers yeah, I mean, their their professors are hiring brewers. They're, I mean, they're, they're brewers who are in charge of hiring at their breweries. They're, most of them are co-owners of their breweries, um, and they know a whole bunch of brewers in the state. So they can say, oh, hey, I don't have any place, any spots open, but why don't you call so-and-so at this brewery, and I'll give you a recommendation, you know? And, and after our program, you know, even if you compare them to somebody who spent a year in a brewery, their resume is already way better than somebody who spent a year in a brewery because they have they have a really well rounded okay or a really well rounded resume because you know they they not only have all that time on brewing equipment, they have recipe design. They they've spent you know over six months doing recipe design stuff. They've done sensory training. They they graduate our program with OSHA 10, um, with uh, Brewers Association safety training. Um, they have surf safe alcohol training. Um, so they have all these certificates and stuff. So mm -hmm. it's just, I think it's it. So it's true that you don't need a brewing education to start your own brewery, but. <laughs> there is still a lot of value in having the brewing education to to break into the brewing industry and also um i know a lot of the a lot of breweries in the area are looking at trying to send their brewers who are already currently brewing at their facilities to our program for the training mm -hmm. is there something to be said for a classical education like that background in biology and chemistry um that would add to certain aspects of being a brewer? Certain aspects, it depends on what you want to do in the brewery and kind of what scale of brewery you work at. Um, Cause to some extent, like, I mean, I don't know if you know, Hartwick started this center for craft food and beverage. Yep. I had heard such things after I graduated, by the way. It right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, they, they do a whole lot of um, testing stuff. So, like, if you need some chemistry stuff done that you can't do, like, you can you can send your samples up there, and they'll do it for a fee. So you don't necessarily need to know all the chemistry stuff. You can, you can farm that out to somebody if you're having problems. So, um, and that's also true with some of the microbiology. But um, if you're gonna, if you like, aspire to work in a lab at a brewery. Um, mm -hmm. then it certainly would be helpful to work, uh, to be a, uh, to have a biology major. And then we actually, I mean, we've had several students who have graduated with bio majors from our department that have nothing to do with the brewing science program, but have gone and done internships at Two Roads, who have gone on into the brewing industry, done lab work. Um, one, one works at Two Roads for a little while, and then she ended up um, running the main uh, microbio lab at, in the, in Connecticut that was certifying medical marijuana as medical grade. Hmm. Okay, yeah. So I, I think there there is definite you know benefit. So I want to you know say that, and I just I you know you hear different things, and I think uh, you know I I'm kind of like I didn't really you know it's one of those careers that. I didn't realize existed even when I was in college. Like you said, we we're naive back then. It's like, 
you knew it because your family, you know, you're, you're, you came from vintners, you, you got that. And it's like, I grew up thinking it was just something monks did in monasteries, you know, uh, cause I grew up in Germany. Yeah. It was, <laughs> you, you didn't think like, yeah, I want to open my own brewery, you know, it's, uh, um, so it, it's, it's interesting, um, to, to hear the different perspectives and, you know, would I have done a degree in this? I don't know. It's one of those things. It's like, whatever. If I still want to, I could still do it. But like I said, I'm more of a uh, consumer versus a creator of uh, fine brews. Um, <laughs> and I'll, I'll keep it that way for now. Um, so your program, and I mentioned this before we, we started, um, and I'll share this article in the chat if, uh, you know, if I can get to it here. Um, this one on Sloop Brewing and their inclusion diversity program, which I find this stuff interesting because, you know, as a science teacher, one of the things I try to do in class is try to get every kid passionate about science so they can enjoy it and maybe even possibly find a career, um, you know, in the sciences. So, um you know, it's definitely something that that's always on my radar as far as, you know, how can I get, you know, my students and have a very diverse uh, student body. Um, and so I want to get all those students, not just a few of them, you know, um, interested in science and in brewing science in general. But I think we can take this up to a, a larger, you know, level as well as, as far as getting a lot of the underserved populations into science because um, we need that. Um, and so, what are what are your thoughts on that? And like, do you see diversity in your program? Um, and are you doing anything particular to kind of, you know, get those underrepresented groups involved? Yeah. So um, that's something that's been a goal of mine since I took over the program. Um, it's we in Connecticut certainly see that there's a lack of diversity. It's kind of like, you know, if you could, you could basically, if you think brewer, you could assume it's a white dude with a beard and tattoos. Yeah. Um, so we, there's in Connecticut. Well, I think it's actually throughout the country. There's a group to increase the diversity, the, um, the, the diversity of um, women in brewing called mm -hmm. the Pink Boots Society. Um, and then we we also recognize that we need some some better racial diversity in, in, in and uh, so at Sacred Heart in January, we hosted the Connecticut Brewers Guild's uh, first annual meeting um kind of a symposium hmm. um and the keynote speaker was a speaker who was um really focused uh, her research on she's a professor at sacred heart whose research is focused on diversity in the workplace so the the and we invited her like the guild invited her because we recognize as an industry that that's a problem so one of the breweries that we work pretty closely with is New England Brewing Company. Um, they, hmm. if you're not in Connecticut, you might not know them well. They're a really well-respected brewery, but they they are so um, they're so well-respected that they can't that all their beer gets consumed in Connecticut. They just can't produce enough to get. Their What's beer this called again? I want to take a road trip. <laughs> New England Brewing Company. There you go. I'm there. As long as I'm allowed to go. I will say I do take beer road trips. I go to I go to Treehouse in Massachusetts um, at least twice a year. So good, good choice. And they don't distribute either. They're just local right there. So you can get New England pretty much I think anywhere in Connecticut. So you could just pop across the border probably and get it, but. Um, it's worth a trip to their brewery. You can get all sorts of beers that are at the brewery. So um, anyhow, so New England Brewing Company, um, I have several friends who work there. Um, 
one of them, Jamal, um, Jamal's black. He started a, um, is it, I forget the exact name of the committee, but it's basically a diversity committee because they, mm -hmm. the brewery decided that they wanted to make a commitment to diversity in the brewing community. They're, uh, they're doing a series of beers that are for raising money for um, basically underserved African-American communities in the New Haven area and um, other um, other underprivileged African-American um, causes. And they decided that they were gonna make one of these beers to raise money for a scholarship for our program. So we're just kind of finalizing that. I don't know if mm -hmm. I should even be saying this yet. So we're just kind of signing paperwork the, for that right the now. The two viewers will keep it out. under wraps. <laughs> Um, yeah, keep it under wraps. Don't don't say it on the internet or anything <laughs> on a live stream. And uh, and then we're also we've also expanded that to a bigger partnership with the Connecticut Brewers Guild. That's probably going to uh, do a second scholarship for a minority student for our program. Um, so and. And we're really proud of that and we're really gonna um i think you know really really push that and hopefully that that advertising that attracts you know even more uh minority students to our program ones that you know we're able to pay for the program as well because it, it is a problem the the diversity in the brewing industry is a, is a problem and i I'd, I'd love to see it change yep like you said, it is kind of like, I think the majority of breweries I've been to, it's that tattooed bearded guy that's serving me a brew. <laughs> um, so speaking of like, are, are do you have other favorite breweries that like maybe I should check out? I mean, uh, that, I mean, you, I, I'm familiar with two roads already. Victory, I like as well. Um, what else? What are your suggestions? Um, that's tricky. Um, <laughs> let's see. Should I be more specific? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm just trying to think like, I, I like a lot of the classics. Like it's, it's hard for me. I mean, I explore the new stuff and I, I just, I, I find good beers here and there and there aren't a lot of breweries that I go just the the brewery as a whole it just like knocks my socks off you know mm -hmm. um and i'm trying to think if there's anything i mean treehouse is a really good choice um uh, i'll plug trillium as well while you're on your way out to treehouse oh yeah yep trillium. Um, check out trillium um that's a good one trillium's owner is an alum of sacred heart Oh, there you go. Okay, there's a connection. Um, so, um, trying to think what else. What else is really good? Um, I'll let you think about it. We can do individual yeah, I'll, beers I'll too. To so, like, if if you have like, uh, what what was your favorite like since we're in fall what was your favorite oktoberfest uh style beer martin i mean what, what which one was, was do you think was a go-to the the um the sierra nevada one domestically the sierra nevada one is always good mm -hmm. yep that's i would um, agree and, and then i like the classic one the classic european ones like course, both a, a good uh you know polliner for me that's it polliner is <laughs> a very good one yeah Eyinger. so yeah it's it's funny like my background is i did grow up in germany yeah, as an army brat and so yep. one of the things you learned in german class were the german purity laws or the bavarian purity laws that germany eventually adopted as a whole and uh and so we actually learned those in German class, so I'm familiar with, you know, all that. And that's why it's, it's funny now here. I'm like, 
the majority of these beers would never be brewed in Germany. <laughs> yeah. Because you know? they're so crazy. You know, the, the crazier they are, the better. You know, what weird stuff can you throw in it, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know like, don't put a Danish in your beer. <laughs> right. It, 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 it's kind of gimmicky, but, you know, uh, but, and so, you know, I was kind of like, for a while, you know, you know, with, with beers, it was kind of, you know, I don't get it. My mom still doesn't get it. You know, she's like, none of this is really beer. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay, mom, it, it's still beer, but just not from a German standpoint, I guess. Um, yeah. But I also remember weird things, you know, growing up where you'd be at a monastery. And I forget which one it was, but they actually had heaters for your beer so you could keep it warm. Because, nice. you know, if it's a good beer, you got to be able to drink it warm. All right. That's one of the ways you can tell it's really good, um, especially when you have to actually warm it up uh, on a cold day. Uh, <laughs> I tell people that and they're like, really? I'm like, yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Or you just drink it lukewarm, like a like a, a good bitter is room temperature. Yep. You know? Yeah. Um, but uh one of the things that I got frustrated at with brewing recently, it's not so bad now because I think more breweries are maturing, was the you could not get a lager because they were all just brewing ales and especially IPAs. I was like, let's shove as much hops in this and you know brew it. So it was like a pet peeve of mine where you would go out someplace and you'd be like, all right, what do you have? And it would just be five different kinds of IPAs. And you're like, Really? That's it. And they'd have like one stout that was kind of like, eh, you know, but no one had any lagers just because it's harder to brew a lager in a smaller brewery is what I expect or what I suspect. So, I mean, is that the case? Do you, do you feel yeah, that's kind of like maturity wise? There's more lagers now than there were before just because we have the brewers are getting better. There's a few reasons for that. Um, I think, um, I think one of the reasons is that, um, the market was demanding it. The, mm -hmm. There was a huge just push for put all the hops you can in everything I want, everything I drink. Um, also, a lager, um, yes, and you mentioned it, like the brewers are getting better. A lager without all the hops and the malt, like where it's really crisp and kind of clean and um, it really exposes any flaws. So any mm -hmm. flaws that are in the beer are kind of really like, naked to you. Like, so you, they're really obvious. Um, so uh, it's, it's a little risky to brew a lager if you're not sure what you're doing. Also, lager, because it's cold brewed, um, it takes a lot longer to ferment. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest uh, bottlenecks in the brewery is your fermenter tank time. So having your beer in your fermenter for a long time ends up um, basically backlogging your production. So by doing a lager, you slow down your production of everything because you you tie up that tank for a long time. Right, and that's why I think when breweries expand like you got that really small local micro brew and they get a bigger place and they get more fermenters then i you know, I've, I've seen it where they will start making a lager just because now they have the the space to do it yep. and if i'm not mistaken a lager usually it uses a different yeast than an ale oh it does way. yeah yep. so that's you know something else where if you're ordering from your supplier you know you, that's something else you're going to have to consider, you know, when you're when you're uh, running your business. Um, and I also think it's different. To, lagers vary a lot less than taste because it, I find a good lager is just a good lager, and it's just going to taste like a lager. You know, you're not going to have chocolate lager or, you know, a hot cocoa lager, right? It's just going to be, you know. A lager, yeah, you know what I mean? It's so you can still make a bad one, but that variety of taste that, you know, breweries like to have all those different types of things, you know, to choose from, you're just going to have your one, you know, lager beer. You know. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there are, there are, very, there's a bit of variation in lagers, but because, because the yeast is so clean mm -hmm. in flavor, you do, you do end up with 
um, a less a less a less of a broad rainbow of of flavors. Yeah, yeah. that might change. Whereas though. with ales, you have a whole lot a whole lot more flavor variety you can get because the yeasts have other other flavors. Like the yeasts have a bigger variety of flavors they can contribute. Yeah. And this gets to the science part, which I found find interesting is, and I knew this and I looked at your slides and I, and I knew this already that, you know, back in the day, you would just leave open your vat of, you know, whatever you were trying to brew and yeast would just fall in there and you would magically have, you know, a fermented beverage. Um, and, and at some point, you know, where was it in history? Maybe you can, I don't, I don't know this, where they decided besides that first brewery in 1050 or whatever, Pyre Stefaner, where I've, I've been there, uh, that they had that variety of yeast. Like, I mean, where did that original one come from? And is there any diversity in that yeast? Yeah. So there is a lot of diversity, um, and we're actually still trying to figure out exactly the, the evolutionary relationships of those things. So it's kind of a really cool evolutionary forensics problem, right? Because we know that there are a whole bunch of different aliens that we can tell are the same species that add really different characteristics to the beers. So we know, and, and they're reproducible, right? We know these are genetic differences that they have. Um, but we know that they've diverged, and but we know they've diverged from some common ancestor. We also know that you mentioned that lager yeast is actually different from the ale yeast. The lager yeast seems to be a fusion of one of those ale yeasts hmm. with uh, wild yeast from Patagonia, which is wacky how some Patagonian yeast got into Europe to fuse with this ale yeast. Um, to make the lager yeast, because lager yeast first appeared um, in Central Europe in like Germany, um, Czech Republic area, um, like, um, so anyhow. But we know there are a whole lot of different varieties and um, trying to figure out where those those original um, ale streams came from um, is, is really an evolutionary question. It's like, how are these things related um, where's you know where did the common ancestor probably come from um and we've made some headway to that and there's some papers that make some claims about that but they're not they're not super strong claims in my opinion mm -hmm. um that so i don't know I, I think we're not we're not still super clear on that but then we also have the complicated question of um like the this the yeast species that we use to ferment beer is the same species that we use to make bread is the same species that we use to make wine and we don't know to what extent those yeasts have been passed between those industries so we do know that in medieval europe most of the monasteries which are the places that were making the, the beers in medieval europe and and that's where most of Western brewing tradition descends from, um, the monasteries almost always had a brewery right next to a bakery, right next door to each other. And so the assumption is they were probably sharing yeast and using exactly the same yeast for their brewing and their baking. And so the, if we can assume that the brewing industry in Western Europe is descended from, uh, um, is descended from that brewing and the bread making industry in Western Europe is descended from that bread making. Maybe those yeasts are both descended from that sort of common point. But that's not clear yet. Well, sounds like somebody's going to have to do some research on that. <laughs> I think so. That's an awesome topic though. I mean, can you imagine like doing that research? Oh, I'm going to have to go to Europe and uh, gather some samples. <laughs> You know, oh no, yeah. <laughs> that'll be a sabbatical right there. Yeah, right. <laughs> nice one. Um, you know, I, I are there any breweries? And I was curious about this that are actually taking like 
wild yeast and breeding them with like the more domesticated yeast in in making beers or you know is that like really risky and they don't want to do that so you know you know because i think it'd, it'd be interesting if you could get a unique flavor that way um but you know maybe that's a selling point for a brewery hey we got wild yeast beer yeah so funny thing all right um the the process of domestication um well i don't know i maybe you do depending on what you teach or don't teach the the process of um sexual reproduction one of the goals of it is to make a variety of offspring right right in in the industry we want consistency right when you right so it turns out there's been so they're not they're not the yeasts aren't obligate sexual reproducers they can produce spores so they can asexually reproduce so it seems like this selection for consistent reproduction of flavor has also selected for um asexual reproduction oh. and so we very rarely see tendency for sexual reproduction in the in industrial strains so in the domesticated strains we they don't breed and so we couldn't crossbreed them with a wild strain but um we have been working um with two roads on a bunch of projects where basically we go we go out in the wild me and my coworker kirk bartholomew um we go various places out in the wild and we collect a whole bunch of yeast from the from the wild we just collect kind of everything we find we use a selection medium that's basically it's basically an unfermented beer that's spiked with a little bit of alcohol mm -hmm. so we kind of select out and so we we let that grow a little bit um so we kind of culture these the stuff that we gathered and anything that's not tolerant of that little bit of alcohol doesn't reproduce but anything that is tolerant of the little bit of alcohol does reproduce so we we get reproduction of that stuff and we take the stuff out of there we culture it on plates so we plate it out and just like you would kind of to isolate um your e coli if you were doing like e coli experiments you want to isolate a single colony we plate these things out on on basically beer auger plates um and we get individual colonies of these different species we pick the colonies and then we put them in individual liquid colonies by which i mean beers and then we do single fermentations with single species of these things that we found in the wild so we're we're basically doing this process of taking this this ecosystem of microorganisms we can tolerate a little bit of alcohol can ferment and then confirming that they can ferment and fermenting with them and then um, doing a sensory analysis after the fact. And for most of them, we smell them and you go, that's really phenolic and gross. And I don't want to ever put that in my mouth and you dump it down the drain. Um, mm -hmm. But occasionally we hit on something that actually um, smells really nice and you go, oh, well, that smells like a nice thing on. Um, and you drink it and you know, that, that might work. And um, We've done that with a couple different strains that actually Two Roads has used in production. Um, nice. So Two Roads has used um, Two Roads has used that used strains that we've gathered in a beer called Urban Funk and one called Country Funk, both of which they sort of referment with. Uh, other cultures afterwards so they they put uh, other yeasts and, and bacteria in afterwards kind of make it like a like a lambic um but then they have another one that they call table terroir uh that's like a table beer like kind of a belgian style table beer like farmhouse ale that's really like three and a half percent alcohol i think um where it's it's fermented just with the one single strain of yeast that we isolated. Um, and it's really nice. It's like really just like a Saison strain. Um, and I, I can't tell you any more about that strain or I have to kill everyone. <laughs> no, but that's, that's really cool. And what a great like way to teach evolution and reproduction and everything else. I mean, it's, it's got like everything, 
right? You can just do like a whole course and, and teach it, which is what you do with just that idea, you know? Um, and there's that, the real life application to evolution and genetics and, you know, development, all that uh, kind of into one, one topic. That, that's what's, that's really cool. I can't teach it in high school, obviously, but uh, made for yeah. <laughs> we, no, we've incorporated this stuff into our sophomore genetics. We have a class that we call genetics and evolution. We teach this um, in that kind of the, the evolutionary forensics things, where we basically, you know, we PCR and sequence a gene from the different strains, and then we try to do do a phylogeny from the data to get, um, and then. Um, we do some of this stuff in freshman biology. One of the first things our freshman bio students do is they do, they do malting and, and brewing and, and kind of learn we, we teach enzymes and carbohydrates by, by having them brew. Mm -hmm. I'm getting ideas. I don't teach bio lab this year, but I've taught it in the past. Um, yeah. and, uh, and one of the New York state standards that they have to know is, you know, and I saw this in your slides as well, the, you know, the monomers of, you know, of sugars like glucose versus, you know, the starches or the disaccharides and understanding how diffusion works, um, you know, across semi-permeable membranes, all that, um, and kids, you know, obviously it's, it's as I, at a very young young age it's hard to think abstractly about these things you can't see it's like well that starch to me looks the same size as you know this this glucose right you can't see any difference really with your eyes and so it, and it's tough for kids to kind of visualize a huge polymer uh you know or you know versus a tiny monomer um and draw those conclusions but you know, this is a, a way to think about that with the yeast. Um, and it's also a great way to get your, your room smelling great when you're doing <laughs> yeast research. <laughs> Indeed. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of other stuff. Like, you know, we've done labs where you look at, uh, you know, production of, of CO2 and stuff using yeast as far as metabolism. You know, it's a good... You know, yeast is a nice, easy thing to use for that. Because you just go to the store, or at least before COVID, you could go to the store and you could buy yeast and uh, and use it in lab uh, the next day. So, hey, Emily, you're back. Oh my gosh, Emily, who's in chat, she said that she was leaving, like social media and everything, and then she came back. So I hope you're well <laughs> and you're doing good. Um, you've come Welcome to back, the Emily. right chat for. Uh, we're talking about mental wellness. Through beer. Well, Scott, if, <laughs> if you want to, um, if you want to teach that, know that you can, um, you can actually, um, when you, if you mask your flask, like if you put, if you do fermentation, like you put yeast in and do your fermentation, you can, you can use the um, loss of mass of your flask to infer how much metabolism happened in there, right? Because the, the, yeah. the, they lose mass by the CO2 molecules that come out. Correct, right? you're and right. so you can infer like how much alcohol you've made in the flask. I never thought and, of that. And, and teach like Avogadro's number and stuff. Mm -hmm. and... I don't get that far. These are only ninth graders if I do it with them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but yeah, you well, can yeah, use the equation sense. and I, I forget, it's like, I think it's equal an equal number of ethanol molecules to CO two molecules. Oh, okay, and it, it, it's interesting because I show my kids sometimes. Um, uh, Veritasm has one where he talks about why you're lightest in the morning, right? And it's not because why people think like you're sweating at night or you know you pee necessarily. It's because you're breathing all night and you're losing carbon oh, all funny. night, and so when you wake up, you're you're the lightest because you haven't you know eaten anything but you've been breathing all night and so it's like like it's one of the things where i never thought of that i was like i have a degree in biology and i never thought of that 
yeah, <laughs> like that, that makes sense but like what you just said makes sense now too i'm like yeah that's the same thing it's like you can take the mass you know before and then after and you know know that rate of metabolism because then you could do it different ways you could say cold water versus hot water and you could change different variables to see how it affects the metabolism that's a that's a dang fine idea for a lab i'm upset i don't yeah. teach bio lab this year now <laughs> That'd be you need a pretty precise fun. balance to do it but um it's a really nice clean way to to make inferences like to what how accurate does the balance have to be what are we i'd have about? to look it up <laughs> sorry uh ninth graders aren't known for being precise people i'll just mention you, that you can always just use a bigger flask you always there you go it's like what are you ordering the you know massive uh erlenmeyer flasks for mr Ryder? <laughs> oh no reason you're not brewing anything are you no no i'm not Though I've been tempted at school. I do have all the nice lab equipment. <laughs> no. <laughs> they right. can't restrict you from culturing yeast, can they? No, they can't. No, they can't. Nope. I'll save my, if I do any brewing, I'll do it at home. I do have a good, I mean, I think everyone has a friend that does brewing. You obviously do. But like, I have a couple friends that, that brew, you know, um, either mead or beer or, or whatever. So, speaking of mead, do you do anything with mead? Like, yeah, I used to make a lot at home. Yeah, yeah. Is that the same yeast, obviously, for mead that you would use for beer? Um, yes. It, I mean, you if you go to the homebrew shop, they'll try to sell you a specialty mead yeast, um, and some people will use wine yeast for it. But really, it's all the same species. There are different strains, but you can, the only real possible problem you could run into is if you're trying to make a high alcohol one, some of the beer strains aren't super tolerant of, of right. like, you know, some mm -hmm. some beer strains are tolerant, maybe only up to like 78% alcohol. So, whereas wine strains, you can pretty much expect to be tolerant up to 12% alcohol, a little mm -hmm. higher. Yep. Well, he's, he's also one of my, I always have these, my friends have these crazy ideas. Like I have one friend that's like, I'm going to open this restaurant in the Philippines with my wife and we're going to move there and blah, 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 you know, crazy stuff. And then I have my one friend who's a brewer, you know, he has a bunch of land and he's like, yeah, I'm going to grow a whole lot of hops on it and everything. I'm like, well, you better get going, buddy. You know, you're not <laughs> a spring chicken no more. Hops take a long time to get, you know, moving. So yeah. <laughs> Which is a whole nother, you know, area that I was thinking about. And I, and I thought of you and beer and, and Hartwick. And back in the day, you know, when I was doing research in Cherry Valley and we were going out, you know, in the Oneonta area. And they were looking at ways to increase the livelihood of agricultural people in, you know, in that Oneonta area, in the southern tier. And they're like... What things can we do and grow to, you know, make money, you know, down here? And I don't know why I didn't think the number of times I'd been to Oma Gang did not suggest hops. <laughs> you know, yeah. at the time, it just wasn't a thing. People are still like, oh, they'll just die. You know, they had that, that thinking. But I know there's a whole nother area of biology relating to brewing having to do with, you know, the the barley and the hops. Um, I know like Cornell Cooperative Extension is big into getting local varieties of barley um, into uh, upstate New York, you know, so they can have that New York state label that everything was made and brewed in, uh, in New York state. Um, does Connecticut have something similar where like, you know, you're trying to get everything made in, you know, Connecticut um, that goes into the beer? There's not quite the same push. We do have some laws. Uh, so there is a farm brewery mm -hmm. license um, or designation, I should say, appellation, whatever you want to call it. Um, but there's there's not 
New York's made a definite push. I mean, it's and so it's not. We don't have quite the obvious push that um, Connecticut or that New York does. Um, but I think the consumers respond to it. So I think kind of the the breweries actually sort of push for that sort of thing. So one one of the classes I teach is just sort of a a site visit class. So we go to we go to we do like brewery tours. Um, we do site visits to different um, locations that do things that are related to brewing. So one of the places we went to was a was a um, a barley farm and maltster. Um, and he was he was just talking about how he's growing all sorts of heirloom um, barleys and stuff, and mm -hmm. how he basically can sell anything that he grows because there's enough demand for it in Connecticut. And and he's you know he'll have people from Connecticut come to him and say, hey, will you grow this for me? I I'd really like to try this out, and he'll do it. Um, so um, so there's not a ton of that. I mean, Connecticut's a dinky state compared to New York. Yeah. So, um, but I, there, I mean, there is a decent push for that. You know, I mean, Hartwick, it has a lot to do with that too. The, the guy who runs Hartwick's program, um, has a background in malting. Um, so he has a lot to do with a lot of that, that grain stuff. And, you know, they have, they have meetings about that. Um, actually the, the guy who I was just talking about here at, um, his, his farm is called Thrall um, Family Malts. Mm -hmm. um, he he learned to do malting up at Hartwick, so he went up there for a training session. For mm -hmm. so he, he learned that up there. So I can't imagine there's that many people that are like professional malters. You know, it it there are. <laughs> It's not like I said. No, it's, it's one of those things where you don't think about it until, I don't know, later in life when you're like, someone does that. You know, there is someone in the world that actually makes this thing or does this process. And how many are there? And how old are they? You know, a lot of times these people with this really long experience, you know, are are, you know, getting older and, you know, and they have that long term expertise that you know you want to have your your students get so they can you know start learning that trade uh almost as an apprenticeship you know at, at, a, yeah. at a young age so that knowledge isn't lost i think i think like like brewing it it has been the domain of of large industries for a mm -hmm. long time um and it's just now moving to kind of smaller crafts farmers but that's that's really challenged by um, the fact that the margins are so small in farming right. for you know, all sorts of you know political reasons and stuff, and it's it's really hard for a small farmer to to make it. Um, but the malting, he actually he makes decent money on the malting. Um, so I think if you if he was just doing the farming, um, he'd he'd be having a hard time getting by. If he was just farming these weird grains. Um, that would be really tough for him but because he's also doing the malting on it um he can he can make a little bit more money on it um but i think that's 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 one big challenge to people really getting into it um yep oh yeah but um malting is a there's so many you know pieces to this and this is one of the things i when we talk about careers in school um, and I'm sure you, you talk about this with your own, you know, students that you're advising or in your classes, you know, and it seems to be like a trend uh, in a lot of industries. There's not just, you know, brewing isn't the only thing within the, you know, larger craft beverage industry, right? There's like so many other pieces to it um, from, you know, distribution all the way through, uh, you know, the malting process. Uh, so, uh, it's not like, it's one of those things where like, if you have a passion for, for, for beer, then there's a job for you somewhere, probably whether it's making websites for those companies or, uh, or making the beer itself. Um, so that's why, like, I try to encourage kids. It's like, you learn as much as you can, because you don't know where you're going to get into a certain industry. 
Yeah. They tell kids the same thing about like, they're always, you know, they are in the sports. It's like, all right, you're not going to play for, you know, an NFL team probably. Right. But yeah. that doesn't mean you can't work in the industry in some capacity. Right. Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's important, especially for the, my, the younger kids that I have that, you know, you know, they think about the big picture. Um, so they don't dismiss any class that they take, you know? Yeah. Now we have, we have on our, on our board of directors is a guy who's a beer enthusiast, who's a professor at Sacred Heart, who's a professor of sports marketing. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, perfectly good way to be into sports. Yep. Yep. Sports and beer. They, they go together for sure. <laughs> True. So, uh, so what projects do you have have coming up? Do you have any other beer? I mean, you've told us a lot of secret gems already, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, any any other uh, breweries that you're working with or going to work with uh, in the near future that you want to share? Or um, no, I don't. I think you heard most of what I have going on. Um, yeah, there's there's nothing sort of actively going on with two roads. I mean, so you this well, so you reminded me when you were talking about like the just leaving your vat open, right, to collect the wild yeast. Um, it's it's funny because the there's been a resurgence in that. Um, so a lot of breweries have gone back to that. So there's this new um, trend of building what is called a cool ship. Hmm. Um, so if you've heard of these cool ship beers, so Allagash Brewery has been doing this for a long time. Allagash has had a cool ship um, where they've been making wild beers for a long time. But so a cool ship is um, after you make your hot beer, right, your hot wort, the way you cool it is typically to run it through a counter current uh, heat exchanger, right? So you run the hot the hot beer one direction and cold water the other direction. And so you'd strip the heat out of it. Um, and, um, but it, uh, the way they historically did it, cause they didn't have, you know, counter current heat exchangers like that is they basically spread it out really thin. So they'd lay it out in a bed, like you, you just spread your beer out really thin in a big bed. Um, and that's called a cool ship. And um, so that it, that's where it would pick up a lot of that that yeast and bacteria that would start the fermentation. Um, and so uh, there's there's a big trend in building cool ships. Um, so Two Roads has a cool ship, um, and we've been doing some uh, molecular um, analyses of some of their cool ship beers to look at uh, what the ecosystems are in uh, in the cool ships, um, kind of what what yeasts and bacteria are they capturing in the cool ship? Um, so we're just kind of starting to analyze those data uh, that we just got back for that, which is really cool. Yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here is that uh, that picture from your slideshow. So I'll just put that up there really quick with the uh, spontaneous fermentation. Right. Right. You got that. So that's so, pretty, yeah, that's pretty cool from ancient times. Yep. So then, right, and so I think what happened, it seems, is that um, you know, it, like looking at this vat, right? You you brew your beer, you get a vat that ferments, and you go, oh well, this is fermenting, and it probably didn't take too much of a brain mm -hmm. to realize that if you took the next batch. And instead of just letting the next batch just sit there, you took the prior batch that was fermenting mm -hmm. and dosed some of it into the new batch, it would start fermenting quicker, right? And so by doing that over and over again, beer after beer after beer, generation after generation after generation, we were probably inadvertently causing some artificial selection for, for yeast that were gonna survive in that particular environment, which is different from whatever natural environment they were in historically. Yeah. And so we were probably artificially selecting and, you know, 
creating these these strains of, of brewer's yeast right really right. early on like yeah. way before louis pasteur even knew what a yeast right. was where was that at uh pasteur was on there somewhere right where he was but anyways yeah so like that's i find that interesting too where it's like before they even knew what yeast was they were using it i mean it can go for a lot of industry it's like you could you know make iron before you knew what a, a an oxidation reaction was you know it's you know right. uh you don't need to know the science behind it to to make it happen um but i think to make better beer uh it does help uh because i'm sure the beer i drink now is better than the swill that they drank out of here uh but i don't know i didn't drink it <laughs> uh it, it's hard to say um, no we're pretty sure even even um you know 150 years ago in england that the beer often had um like britannomyces in it um off flavors you know wild yeasts and bacteria in it um it was and it was i mean it's not as big of a deal if you drink it fresh you know um it's mm -hmm. it's it is a big deal if you try to package it and let it sit around for a while. Um, so, cause those flavors will start to, I mean, the, the bacteria and the, and the Britannomyces like wild yeasts, um, will, will eat a lot of the sugars that your that the Saccharomyces can't, your normal brewer's yeast can't eat. Um, mm -hmm. so your normal brewer's yeast leaves a lot of residual sugars, a lot of residual carbohydrates that it doesn't turn into alcohol, which is like the right. body of the beer, um, and the sweetness. Um, but there are other organisms that want to come in and eat that because yep. they can, and it's a, it's a really good energy source for them. So they, they come in and if they eat that and you've got a bottle, um, you know, you've got a bottle bomb. <laughs> because they, they eat that and put off CO2 and um, and pressurize the bottle. So, yep. And, and I also, you know, you think, you know, since, you know, they didn't have, they didn't pasteurize anything, you know, back in the day either. But I think it was also, you could brew it as fast as you, people would drink it. You know, it's not like it sat around. Right. Or, and you didn't ship it a hundred miles away. You know, that wasn't until like Miller Coors, you know, or what was that Miller, but did they develop these larger, you know, shipping um, industries, I think, that uh, that we have now uh, yeah. for, for better or for worse, you know, but I think it's definitely, uh, I, I, I like having this topic and in this slide, you have the bread next to the beer, which goes together as the good German that I am, uh, you're broke with your beer. Um, but they use yeah. the same yeast as we know. So that's, yeah, that's, that's fascinating. Um, the written beer history. So I'll have, you know, what grade was I in seventh grade? I did a report on Charlemagne. Okay. Nice. I don't remember much about it, but I do remember that I did it. <laughs> Well, so so the first written record of hops being used was actually recorded by Charlemagne's cousin Adelard of Corby um, in eight hundred something. Um, so he was he was a monk, and it was the, yeah. the first re first record of hops ever being used in beer. But the the use of hops in beer didn't become common in Europe until really like the fourteen hundreds. So oh, really. Hmm. Yeah, prior to that, they were using just whatever spices. They use, they use things like bog myrtle or basil or whatever, um, and some kind of herb, just any kind of bitter herb. Hmm. So it wasn't it wasn't sort of ubiquitous to use hops. It wasn't assumed that you were using hops. Hmm. Maybe someday there will be a retro uh, beer. Actually, there have been a couple I've seen that were kind of. Yeah, they call it they call it gruit. Yeah. G R U I T. Okay. So if you ever see a gruit, it's it's spiced with something other than hops. Yep. So you start this this time of year, you start to see a lot of spiced beers, right? 
in the fall yeah. and into uh, the winter. You know, some of them I can I'll like, but sometimes you know, sometimes you just want a lager, a nice straight up lager, nice clear golden. Um, I don't need your cinnamon and uh, herb encrusted beer or whatever. Or like a Doppelbach, which is a oh, lager. Yep. But... Yep. So, uh, but yeah, there, there's, but I, I think it's interesting where, and it makes sense, kind of like you see like things like pumpkin beer. You're like, pumpkin beer? How do you make a pumpkin beer? But cultures always infuse themselves into what you consume as, as food and, and drink. So it just makes sense that in the Northeast in particular, you would have pumpkin beer, right? Because it's culturally, that's what you do, right? Same thing if you went somewhere, like if you went to India, you would have a curry beer, right? Uh, I don't know how that would taste, but um, someone's probably done it. <laughs> uh, but you know what I mean? It's like culturally you, you expect that kind of thing, right? Yeah. And the same thing we see here, like what do they make the beer with? Well, what they had, you know, it, it's not, you know, it's not a mystery. You know, it's like, what do, what do we have around here? We can shove in here and ferment it and uh, get something we can drink. All right, <laughs> so let's make it. That's pretty much how fermentation goes around the world. Yeah, it's like, what... <laughs> What can we put yeast with and get booze from? <laughs> yep. Yep. This makes me want to go out and try some more beer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I love this time of year as far as uh, the different beers. Because the, the, the breweries do go through cycles, right? And they, they start putting out the next season's beer, like, you know, just like the stores put out the next seasons decorations um you know to kind of get ready um and i'm I'm always i always like you know i like dark beers in the winter you know i like my my stouts um you know so and my porters so i like to i like to get those going in the in the winter so uh and they always make more of them in the winter so i'm I'm usually happy in, in the winter as far as beer selection um the spring i can do without all the the sours that's like the sours are the one beers that i i i've tried and i like if i want grapefruit juice i'll drink grapefruit juice you know i you know or else if i want an alcoholic grapefruit juice i'll put a shot of vodka in it yeah I, <laughs> but that's I just you. my I personal <laughs> you know uh that's just me though being like bitter old man i guess <laughs> you know um and, yes, and my, cur- my curmudgeoniness <laughs> like dang it i'm in there think beers and their sours you know <laughs> i've had a few i was actually at the oak was that two two years ago i think it was two or three years ago and they had a sour there and the, the, the barmaid she was like oh you've got to try this up uh, if you you know, I guarantee you, you'll love it. And I'm like, all right, serve it to me. <laughs> and yeah, it was terrible. It, <laughs> I didn't like it. So, uh, whatever. You remember the oak? Oh yeah, you remember the oak. Oh, I remember the oak, yeah. <laughs> so how I got into the oak my, uh, my junior year, I would just go down there at five o'clock before they put the uh, bouncers out the door. So you oh, just stay nice. in there until, you know, 11 o'clock and then you're all set. Hey. <laughs> I don't think I could afford the oak for that long. Oh, yeah, friends. But, hey, you could yeah. get a pitcher for like five bucks back then. Are you kidding? That's right, yeah. <laughs> a pitcher of honey brown. Of honey brown. Like yeah. six bucks. <laughs> and you're good. <laughs> but then it's okay because you could leave and there would have been like, they'd ask for ID and be like, oh, I was just in here. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's right. You left. And then you just go back in. See, <laughs> I, I had a system. Nice. I didn't learn a lot in college, but I learned how to game the, the, the bar system. There you go. <laughs> just tell your students that. Oh, yeah. Learn everything you can. Yeah. Yeah. He'll, you got 
I, I have plenty of, of tidbits. The kids today, like, I, I'm not going to see them for uh, the group I had today because they're off. I don't have them tomorrow, and then we don't have them on Friday. So I was like, make sure you run faster than the cops this weekend. All right. Please. <laughs> Stay one step ahead. <laughs> Well, because the one we'd, girl in we'd class, be a good influence. yeah. Well, the one girl in class I was talking about, she was like every story she would tell was like, "Well, the cops were chasing me." <laughs> I'm like, "Why is it that every story you tell involves the cops chasing you, and yet you don't want to be regarded as a troublemaker?" <laughs> Something's not adding up here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I love working with kids. <laughs> it's fun. It's funny. Anyway, so let's go back to the, the beer talk. Uh, more about my background here. The fire stuff on are here. We used to get these all the time. I'd lived fairly close to here, I believe. I'd been there oh, did you? once. Yeah. Yeah, so, cool. So I was about two hours north of Munich, uh, an hour outside of Nuremberg, so down in that area. So... They also have one of the most reputable beer schools in the world. Oh, really? That I did not know. Yep. I would believe it. I've been doing it for so long. You hope that you would be able to pass on your knowledge. So, uh, but I'm sure they teach you how to abide by those German purity laws. I'm sure they do. Yeah. yeah. But uh, as far as the German purity laws, though, one of the requirements for really good beer is really good water. Yep. And so this is why a lot of brewers are against fracking. <laughs> I don't want to get you know political about fracking. However, <laughs> uh, one of the reasons there's not a lot, you know, there wasn't a huge push for fracking in like the southern tier in New York State was because a lot of the brewers were just like, absolutely not, because it'll potentially ruin the water for all the beer making for, you know, that area of New York State. I hadn't and, heard that. And that's important. And that you gotta have important. good water, right? Oma Gang was a big one. They were big into making sure that there wasn't fracking in, you know, that area especially. Uh, so it would affect the quality of their beer. Because, you know, you this, use the water that's local. This uh Vine Stefan reminds me, um, so I did like a week sort of pseudo internship in the lab at Trogues, mm -hmm. um, and the the head of their lab was trained at Vine Stefano um, at at the school, um, and so Trogues is a brewery I can recommend highly. Yep. If you I, haven't, I've had them. some of their stuff as well. Yeah. Trogues. This Are time of year, look for Mad Elf. Ooh, Mad Elf. See, I'm getting good stuff here. If I can get, I gotta go out and find it probably. One of my you beverage probably centers. Do. It's not easy. It's probably not easy to find up where you are. So I'm gonna have to make that trip to Connecticut, and uh, have Trogues my. Trogues is actually Trogues so. is actually in Pennsylvania. Oh, that's in Pennsylvania. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'll have to make a trip to Pennsylvania. <laughs> I remember back when you could only get Yingling in Pennsylvania. I do too. So, so my job right out of college was I worked for the Forest Service at the Allegheny National Forest. And uh, cause my expertise was in identifying and counting trees. Um, and so in there, it was like, that's all you, you had pretty much was yingling. It was like everywhere. And I was like, oh, okay. And then like, you know, I moved to the Albany area and like, it, you know, it disappeared. And then like a few years later became, you know, it was bought out and mass produced. And then it was everywhere. So yeah. So that's uh, that's a little story about uh, Yingling and the National Forest Service. <laughs> My life in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is weird though. Different laws like there, they have these barns and you would just drive in. It's kind of like Corona now, right? And you would pop your trunk. They'd put the beer that you want in your trunk. They'd close it. You would pay and then you drive out. Yep. Yeah. You know, the, like, and they call it they call it the distributor. Yep. And it's like okay. And uh, if you wanted like a six pack, you'd have to just go into the bar, ask for a six pack or something, and then you, they give you a six pack and you'd leave. Yeah, it's so weird. <laughs> I don't like, know. Like, 
what <laughs> you know i come from from germany where you could just go buy beer by the half liter and be happy with it <laughs> yeah right seems yeah. sensible these these weird you know strange blue laws that still exist in some places that yeah that they've gotten rid of in most places now at least um, there's still a couple of weird ones but in new york they state away least, them. Yeah, yeah new york state it's it's reasonable now at least there's still a couple of weird ones like you can't sell f like food the same place that you sell like wine and spirits yeah so you can't mm. sell wine and spirits in your grocery stores essentially so the lobby for the wine and spirit stores is quite strong. So weird stuff. We couldn't we couldn't get growlers in Connecticut until like two thousand five, <laughs> I think. And we still you couldn't you could only get them from the source until COVID. Then they finally at COVID they started letting bars sell growlers. You know, growlers are weird in New York City because there's I don't think there's any written law about it, but some places won't fill them now that used to because of COVID. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Like one of our locally local grocery stores had like a growler station and they used to fill it. But you can't fill your own growler. You have to buy you can buy a growler and they'll fill it. But you can't fill your growler. And I'm just like this makes no I mean, just because I touch it and I give it to you, I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah, you know, maybe because they don't know if it's clean, if it's sterile. Yeah, but other places will fill it. You know, they'll clean huh. it for you. And it was also, there was, like, did you go to Cooperstown Brewery when you were in Ohio? Yeah. Yeah. That place was bench warmer. Yeah, great beer. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh we used to, you know, get mason jars. We just get like the case of mason jars, and you would go there and you just fill them, and then you'd go watch the football game or whatever, right? So, <laughs> and so after you know, I went. We went back a while. You know, this is like ten years ago, probably. I graduated a long time ago, and they wouldn't fill mason jars, and it's just like, well, why not? And they're like the whole, well, we don't know if they're clean kind of thing, and it's like didn't stop you, <laughs> you know before and then in places around here will do it now as well because i asked my local microbrew in town and i was like if i brought mason jars to you would you fill up the mason jars They're like oh yeah sure you know we'll just charge you you know per you know pint or however big it is yeah i'm like okay you know so uh, I, it, it doesn't seem to be any law it just seems to be the preference of who is selling whether or not they decide they want to do it or not yeah so it's weird um other weird new york stuff <laughs> so i don't know how you're familiar with covid in new york but cuomo decided that to keep the numbers down in bars he would actually enforce an old standing law where if you were to buy an alcoholic beverage you would also have to buy a food item with your first alcoholic beverage purchase. So you just can't go up to a bar and order a drink. You have to go up, order a drink, and also get some food item that's commensurate to the establishment that you're in. So like when I go to the microbrew here in town, uh, the Real McCoy Brewing Company, I'll give them a plug. Um, you know, if, if I go there and I get a beer i also have to buy one dollar peanuts i was gonna say are people selling right. like 50 cent peanuts? it used to be that you'd get them for free right because they were just like it was a bar right and you would just right there so like a a, a, a brew pub you know a brewery like that you know they can do that but if you go to a restaurant you have to buy like an appetizer or an actual meal and so it's That's like annoying. yeah it's just kind of like uh, yeah i just can't like yeah, no, it, it, it's but it, I guess it was a law that was always on the books, but it was never enforced. Yeah, right. Because who would enforce it until you know our our governor, who's great with a lot of things, but that 
like him enforcing that just pissed off a lot of people <laughs> you know because it's like just because people in new york city couldn't like get their act together and not go to bars in mass numbers yeah but, uh it's a, it, I, I can laugh about it it's got it's just annoying you know it's not like it that bothers funny. me that much it's not like i you know go out every day and have to buy peanuts or something but it's just annoying <laughs> All right, what else you got? Throw me with your stories. Oh, geez, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> what else do I have? Let me see if I have stories in my slides here. Um, oh, uh, let me tell you about Via Cordis, because that's probably coming back. So slide three. Oh. But we might as well go back to slide one and embarrass me. Okay, even more so than you've already been embarrassed. Yeah. I'm just scrolling here through the slide deck. That's how I roll right now. There we go. I grew up fermenting. There you go. There you are. Yeah, so, so the one that's me is the one in the awesome Pink Floyd shirt, of course nice and like yeah so so like um yeah my dad's an engineer and he decided when before i can even remember that he was going to start this hobby of making wine um and he he grew up on a on a 50 acre property that a lot of which was farm um and so he's used to kind of farming um and so he he was he decided he was going to grow his own fruit. Um, so we had a vineyard in the backyard, and um, it was so so we were making wine ever since I can remember. And he's pretty meticulous, and he would make a, like he would win national amateur competitions all the time, like for for his varieties, like the varieties he'd submit. Um, he'd he'd win medals um, almost for everything almost everything he'd submit um so he was good he was making good wine um to me it was just chores like you know <laughs> there in my pink floyd shirt i'd rather go up upstairs and practice my bass or play my sega genesis or something um you know so it i wasn't really into it but i did it a lot right like so i learned a lot about it when i was a kid um but it was like winemaking wasn't really for me um, and like, he'd let us taste the wines and stuff, but it just wasn't, it didn't grab me. Like, mm -hmm. um, but then when I got to college, um, you know, I started to drink craft beers like honey Brown and Saranac pale ale and, um, and Omegang oh and, you know, kind of really got into it. Um, and so, um, and so my dad, you know, knew I was starting to get into craft beer and he was like, Hey, if you want to try making your own beer, um, you know, I think there's like a section in one of my books about it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll help you out with it. Like what, we can try it together. Like, let's go get a kit and we can try it together. I said, uh, let me, all right, let me think about it. I'll read that section of the book. And, um, so we decided to do that. And I went to the shop because most, most homebrew shops are also wine shops. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, we went to his wine shop and, you know, asked for the homebrew kit and, you know, got a little bit of equipment and we did, we did our, our first batch together. Um, and so, um, and that was 1999, I think I was, a I think I was a junior. Um, yeah, that might've been the su summer before my senior year at Hartwick. Um, so anyhow, so that's kind of how I got started making beer. Um, and then, like I said, through grad school, I, I kept brewing and I kind of brewed a lot through grad school. Um, you know, live, I lived alone through grad school, uh, for, for the first few years. Um, so kind of just brewed a lot, um, drank too much. Um, and, uh, if you want to go on to the next slide.
Um, yeah, that's just kind of a history of some of the stuff I've done. That's me meeting Michael Jackson. The second slide is me meeting Michael Jackson, the beer hunter. So mm -hmm. it's the other Michael Jackson, um, who really a lot of people would credit him with uh, really uh, the starting the craft beer movement because he wrote a bunch of books about um, all these kind of foreign beers that were obscure that um, we really couldn't get. And he was really good at describing them and um, really, um, really, I don't know what's, what's a good word for it. Like he, he was great at describing beers and he exposed people to all these beers that they had never really heard of before and people would seek them out. And so it, it really had a lot to do with launching kind of the, the whole kind of craft beer, um, surge that happened in like the eighties, nineties. So, uh, and that's at that's at the Great Great British Beer Festival, I think, in two thousand four, two thousand five. Mm -hmm. um, so Via Cordis is this cool thing. Um, this is shortly after we started working with Two Roads. Um, they had been open maybe th three or four years, um, mm -hmm. and it was our um, uh, it was our fiftieth anniversary at Sacred Heart, um, and I had been trying to push for Sacred Heart to make a beer, um, that, to kind of make a beer with Two Roads um, and maybe make like a beer all the time with Two Roads, but we were trying to figure out exactly what we could do that, that they would let me do. Um, and I, so at home I was kind of doing pilot batches um, and so kind of brewing, brewing a bunch of different batches of beer and fermenting with different yeasts and stuff and trying out different recipes. Um, and so uh, we finally kind of took this idea to the marketing people at Sacred Heart and said, "Hey, you, why don't you try these beers? Um, you know, we want to, we want to kind of want to do this thing, and we want to take it to Two Roads and see if they're willing to do it." Um, and they they were totally in on it. They loved it, and um, and Two Roads said they loved it too because they like you know they they're into working with community partners and stuff. Right. So. Um, so this this recipe is I call it an Abbey Abbey Blonde or Abbey Single, um, and it's fermented with one of the uh, a yeast from one of the Belgian Trappist monast monasteries, um, and so it's you know it, it's Catholic, <laughs> Sacred Hearts of Catholic <laughs> University, um, so it's the Catholic yeast, um, and uh, it's just a really nice kind of uh, really characterful um, light beer five. I think it's 5.2%. Five two, five um, we brewed it that year, and uh, Two Roads considered it a seasonal. So they brewed it that year. They brewed it again the following year. Um, and then they, they have seasonals that they kind of drop out of rotation. So they've dropped it out of rotation. Um, but I think they're bringing it back because of the brewing science program. So we're in kind of discussions about that right now. So that's something you could. I, I don't know if it's going to make it to cans, so if it'll make it to distribution. I'm hoping it does. But you could see that on your shelves. When I um, when we brewed it the last time, I was down in Philly visiting one of my brothers and saw it on a shelf down there. So um, that must have been which cool. Was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, it is cool. Yeah, it's like, hey, I made that. <laughs> so. It's almost like seeing uh, like one of your former students doing something successful. It's like, oh, exactly. I'm seeing a yeah. beer I created <laughs> being <Yeah>. successful. <laughs> exactly. So that's awesome. Now, what is your, you, you still home brew yourself? I actually haven't brewed at home okay. in quite a while. It's been years to be honest. Okay. I didn't know um, if you were still, I mean, it's like, it's almost like, what's the point we can actually use an, you know, brewery to brew your beers or, you know, versus, you know, I, I did it once and it was just, it was a time consuming process out of which came a small amount of beer I could consume, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I like the experience and everything, but it was like, as I said, I'd rather just walk down the street and, and have a beer uh, than have to go through the whole process myself. Um, but let's go to... I, I still love the process, and I, I love that it's... Um, I mean, obviously, you you are also kind of both a 
an artist and a a, a scientist, right? Yep. You know, being that you play guitar. Um, I I love that brewing is kind of a marriage of art and science. Um, Mm-hmm. And and so I I really like that about it. Um, yeah, these are a couple other beers that we worked on. I mentioned these. These are the, yeah, the funk uh, wild and things, the things we grabbed. Um, so urban funk was um, urban funk and country funk are two different yeasts that we grabbed. So um, urban funk is actually made from a yeast that we grabbed during Hurricane Sandy. <laughs> Kirk. Kirk put a, a bucket of unfermented beer out in front of his garage during Hurricane Sandy, and we got cultures from that. So that's what the primary fermenter of that was. We we decided not to advertise it that way, though. <laughs> it's like, yeah. here's what we've done with your misery. I think Sandy Funk wouldn't have sell, sold that well. No, but, yeah, but... probably not. <laughs> um, yeah. So then if I, if I were to, um, yeah, and that's just talking about some of the teaching stuff we do. That's stuff I've already talked about. I like the um, idea of the Ireland campus. That's pretty cool too. So. Yeah. So we bought a campus in Dingle, Ireland, which is, which is really beautiful and cool. And on the Dingle I've Peninsula. <laughs> yeah. I went to Ireland for the first time two years ago now. Yeah. So I drank a lot of Guinness. Yeah. Uh, did you go to Dingle? No, we did not go to Dingle, unfortunately. But next time. Did uh, you go to Cary? Uh, no. We were mainly, we did like, we did the north section. Um, okay. And we ended up in uh, in uh, Galway. So. Yeah, so this is just a bit, I think, southwest of Galway, if I have my geography right. On, on the coast so we do a lot of coastal stuff yep. there yeah we were close to dingle i remember but i went to scotland last summer thank god we got there when we did and not try to go this past summer but oh scotland yeah. was nice they have they have they have good brews there for sure were, were you in edinburgh yep cool yep um, yeah i've been to edinburgh I, I was in edinburgh for a while alone so I was just kind of like backpacking it for a while there. Um, that was a lot of fun. Oh, I can see, especially backpacking. Our uh, Airbnb that we had was right above a pub. So, and we didn't, I didn't even know what we got it. It was kind of like Airbnb. I'm like, hey, it's right above a pub. So like every night I was watching cricket and uh, and trying to working my way down the line of uh, brews that they had there. So nice. <laughs> So that was my vacation. <laughs> stumble upstairs. Yep. Yeah. I usually didn't stumble. I only had one a night. I was there for, you know, several uh, days. One, maybe two. Uh, but like some of the bitters, as you know, are like, you know, three point five percent, you right. know, or or four percent. So it's like the more the bigger problem is the calories that you're consuming. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so like I say you're consuming two 3.5 percent or four percent beers it's like the same as like one of these you know ipas right. you know right. that's like eight percent so so that's the other thing that bugs me sometimes when you go out for a drink you know at a at a brewery and like every beer is like seven percent or over and you're like all right i'll just have the eight ounce glass you know, instead of, like I said, you get something that's like, sometimes you want something that's only 5%, you know? Yeah. So you could have a full pint and then, you know, and your peanuts. <laughs> yeah. For your New York State. But, okay, that's me being an old man uh, crotchety again. So um, I am going to uh, end the stream here at some point. I'm not done with my okay. beer yet, but it is getting late. I don't know what you have to do tomorrow. I have a lecture tomorrow, so I still have to work on it a little bit. Uh, we are making, uh, for part of ours, we are making slime. Uh, nice. In class. So I love my job. I can see I can just make, uh, you, we talk polymers, because again, because we're taking our glue with our borax and highlighters, whoosh, glow slime. Got a huge black light. 
So nice. fun times. So, um, so that's what I'll be doing tomorrow in my, both my classes, actually. That's part of the class. We have other stuff we're doing, of course, as well. Um, cause we have a block this year. So I have an hour and a half block, uh, with the kids. So it's a long time, that's tough. but, uh, that is a long time. but when you're making slime, it goes by you know, pretty quick. So, but I did have to experiment, you know, as, as far as like my job and experimentation, there are probably, you know, a hundred different recipes for glow slime on the internet requiring various ingredients. And so like I had to like peruse all the different recipes, think about what ingredients I had on hand and then try some out to see if they worked. Cause I don't want to try them and, you know, have them fail in class. That'd be miserable because then you're really screwed. You want to see right. a disaster. You have eighth graders with nothing to do. Um, and so like, so that was me this past week trying to figure out what I'm going to do and trying these different versions of glow slime to see, you know, what would work with what I had. So kids don't realize how much prep it took me. You know, the kids are just like, we made slime all the time last year. It was fun. It's like, oh, great. Me, I was like much more analytical about <laughs> what I was doing. I'm like, what's the ratio of glue to borax that I need? And what solution concentration of borax is the ideal slime? <laughs> you know, that's the research I did. <laughs> A little different. <laughs> yep. And then there was me yesterday. I had... I had left because I got a doctor's appointment. So, you know, I, I left like in a hurry to get out of there. And then like later that evening, I'm like around dinner time. I was like, oh, crap. I was like, I left the one burner on. I'm like, oh, shoot. And, you know, so I had to like call up my principal. I'm like, I think I left the, the oven on. <laughs> you know, I think the burner is on in my prep room. He's like, all right, I'll send some of maintenance up there to check it out. Yep, that baby was on. I went in there today because I had unplugged. I'm like, yep, it was still on. It was like really low because I was just like, I'd put a bunch of highlighters in water and I was like in some borax because I was making it the colored, you know, borax highlighter yeah. stuff, which works great. But uh, it might have been okay by the next day, but you never know when that stuff starts, you know, evaporating off. But yeah, that was, yeah, crazy life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I have to teach history of fermentation tomorrow. Oh, excellent! So. We covered some of that tonight. So you we did. <laughs> it's like a, a, it's uh, fresh in my mind. Except I have to talk about it for a whole semester. So oh, I, I need a little more detail. Oh, okay. Have you taught this before, or is this like a brand new? It's a brand new class. Yeah. And so I, I sort of, I've borrowed from another class. I've, I've made it kind of a general bio class. So I've, I've, I've spent some time talking about kind of macromolecules. Mm -hmm. um, talk, well, I finished my last class talking about, um, talking about cell structure a bit. So gonna do a little bit of um, diversity tomorrow, I think, and evolutionary mm -hmm. history kind of um, go through rapidly through the history of evolution of our our lineage and get into the evolution of humans kind of leading up into our our origins in africa and um and then the the origins of culture because it seems like the origins kind of the origins of culture when we started to kind of settle down and make city states probably has a lot to do with um when we really started to have this intimate relationship with fermentation because that's really when we started to store stuff. Right. And you had right. agriculture so you could have the grains. Right. You know, and when you're nomadic, you don't want to store stuff. Right? right. Was it in those cultures or the ones where they, it's like spit in a pot and they just like bash stuff together and that's how they do the fermentation. Yeah, that, I mean, they still do that in, um, in, uh, Central America, make mm -hmm. chicha. Yeah, chew up the corn, spit spit it out. That's kind of gross. It is kind of gross. But yeah, I haven't tried it, so it's, maybe it's I still great. want to try it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of the history. But like I said before, about like your your pumpkin spice beer. It's culturally, 
Yeah. Your culture bleeds into, you know, what you eat and what you make. So yeah. for a time I was like, ugh, pumpkin beer. How dare they? And then I'm like, eh, culturally, you know. It's a starch. Yep. Right. Like anything, that's what they've done throughout time, as you, you'll teach your kids. You incorporate what you have around you into what you consume. Yeah. Yeah. It, or eat for that matter as well you know yeah. you know you'll eat whatever meat you have available essentially if you're human and you'll drink whatever booze you have available as well that's right <laughs> ferment, ferment whatever carb whatever carbohydrate source you have yep whatever sugars you got whatever sugars you got yep. ferment it <laughs> and it's amazing how natural okay i'm going to go off on more tangents and talk the science because it's really cool uh, it's amazing how natural fermentation is. I mean, it happens all the time. Like, you don't even realize it. Whenever fruit rots, it's essentially fermenting, right? Yeah. And it's like, you know, sitting on a tree or falling on the ground, you know, that fermentation process is a natural process. It's just, it's just happening. It's just, so be it that us humans, you know, figured out a, a way to, uh, you know, incorporate that into our culture. <laughs> all right yeah moron has we, we choice start. choice comments by moron there yep yeah <laughs> we harnessed it yeah we harness it like good humans that's what we do harness the powers of nature we can go to the moon and we can make pumpkin beer <laughs> <laughs> One, I think, is a little more grandiose than the other. <laughs> so, all right. It's almost 11 o'clock. Um, we're going to call our chat. I might have you back. So, all right. For sure. Uh, I say that a lot. Of, and if, if there is someone that you think or you know of that you know would like to come in and, and chat with me, please hook me up. I'm always looking for more guests. Um. I was actually thinking of, besides you, I knew we could talk really well about science and fermentation, talking about some of the local brewers that, you know, I know as well. Um, but this was, I learned a lot tonight, tonight. I'm sure your students will learn a lot tomorrow as well from you in the rest of the semester. So I wish you luck in this crazy Thanks. mess that education is right now. Um, it's not easy, especially for someone like you that I know as well does lots of hands-on you know type labs it's tough not having that same lab experience that we used to be accustomed to so good luck and uh you know may you be successful in your education as bizarre as it is um and we'll we'll be in contact for sure good luck with your slime we'll have fun Always a good time. I think you will. I, <laughs> I, I kind of wish I could make some glowing slime. Well, you should have been an eighth grade science teacher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for uh, volunteering to do this. It was so much fun. Awesome. All right. It was fun. All right. Enjoy the rest of your night. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye.